Numbers 14, uh, page 229 in the Bibles, if you want to follow along. We're going to pick up right in the middle of a story, kind of as a teaser. We'll get the little more fleshed out uh, context of what's going on as I, as I speak. But in this passage, Numbers 14, we're just going verses 5 through 11, kind of picking this up right in the middle of a, of a story. Verse 14, 5 through 11, and the word of the Lord says this, Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had, been, who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. And then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them? So ends the reading of the word of the Lord tonight. In impossible. This week has been impossible, thought Mary, as she left the doctor's office with the worst kind of news, the news of, of cancer and not the good kind of cancer. And this came in a week that was already feeling impossible to deal with. This was a week where she had found out through others that her closest friend of many years had said some vicious words about her behind her back one of those weeks where things are just falling apart, thing after thing, the betrayal of friendship, and now she's finding news of the betrayal of her body, cancer. Mary w walked out of the, the doctor's office in a daze, and, and she sat in her car in the parking lot just saying, God, where are you? This feels impossible. And weeping, she sat in her car just feeling alone in the face of things that she didn't know how to deal with that seemed beyond her. See, impossible. I think all of us can assume that at some point in our life, maybe more often than not, we'll walk into situations that, that feel impossible. How will God work in this? How, I don't know how this is going to work out. Our bodies betray us to illness. Sin corrupts relationships that we have. And greed and betrayal come in. And there are times where healing from all of this just feels impossible to come by. Or maybe we've worked hard and we're paying bills and we're okay. And then there's the emergency and the money's gone. And you say, this just feels impossible. I don't know how to provide now. Where's the money? Maybe we look around at, at the world around us and we just feel like things seem to be impossible to deal with. And, and we live in fear of that. Brothers and sisters tonight, we all face situations that have felt or will feel impossible to deal with. What do we do when we're breaking down in those moments? We feel overwhelmed. Who do we turn to? What, what saves us? What carries us through? The thing that we went to numbers for today is that we can take encouragement looking through Scripture that time and time again, the people in the Bible face situations that felt impossible. We're not alone in that, and I find a lot of hope in that. But I want us to discover something tonight as we look through this particular story. Something is going on time and time again in the scriptures that makes the impossible possible to get through. I'll say that again. Something goes on every time there's an impossible situation in scripture that makes that impossible thing possible. So let's dive in a little bit. We're going to get a little bigger picture 
this seemingly impossible series of events plays itself out. Uh, we're, we'll just look at a portion of it, but we'll start back in Genesis. And the God we worship has called one man, Abraham, and has said to Abraham, I, I'm going to make some promises to you. I'm, I'm going to bring from your line descendants that are as numerous as the dust on the earth, and then I'm going to give you this land for them to go to. Sounds pretty good. And yet the years pass, and Abraham gets old, and there's no son, so there's no line. There's no way to have descendants. Abraham gets to 100. It's an impossible situation. What's going to happen? And yet God works. And God shows up and gives Abraham and Sarah a son out of nowhere. So 400 years then pass in the scriptures. We get to the book of Exodus, and, and those same people of Abraham have become a nation, and yet they're not in the promised land. In fact, they're far away enslaved in Egypt, how do they get free? How would this nation ever even get to the promised land? It's an impossible situation. And God shows up. And these are the words of God. God says, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a land that is good and broad, a land flowing with milk and honey. It's from Exodus 3. And then God calls Moses to lead the people free. And you think, well, how would Moses do that? He's pretty inadequate. It's a pretty impossible situation, but God equips him. And God does signs and wonders, and the people are set free. And they rush out of Egypt, and they end up in the wilderness at the Red Sea, and then the Egyptians change their minds, and they chase them down, and they're trapped Israelites. It's an impossible situation again. And God splits the sea, and he does things that blow your mind. And, and so they can walk across the sea, and they're, and they're free. When impossible situations come up, it's always God. And it always was God who makes a way, who provides a way. We have to rely on God over and over. Not, not our own wits, not our strength, you know, not even our own desperate, panicked efforts to get out of a situation. We can, we can get really worked up and try to deal with something, but it's not going to work. God is the one that makes it work. God has proven himself, even that, that little glimpse in Scripture, time and time again, I'll handle the impossible. I'll make it possible. Let's go back to those Israelites. They, they cross the Red Sea, they end up in Mount Sinai, and... Um, they're at the mountain, and God works with them. He forms a covenant, and they're there. They're given the law, these descendants of Abraham, and then God moves them out, and he sends them, hey, we're going to go to the promised land now. So for two months, they travel, and you'd have to assume that fresh in their minds in this whole process is all these ways that God has taken the impossible and made it possible. You think they have to be remembering the Red Sea and how they were not that long ago in slavery, and now they're free. And, and in that, all of that memory, for some reason, we start to see a pattern that is pretty not good with the Israelites. They start realizing and having these moments where even though the memories are there, and even though there's this process of like we can look at all these ways that God has done stuff they start to forget that so quickly you read the Bible and you think how could they forget so quickly but here's what happens they get to the edge of the promised land and God speaks to them and he says send men to spy out the land of Canaan which I am giving to the people you know it's, it's God's way of saying once again I'm I'm going to do the impossible. It wouldn't be possible for you as a nation to just go take this whole land. But I'll, I'll make it work. I'll make it possible. You know, and, and these spies can go in as, as a celebration tour. Like, hey, look what we're going to get. But that ugly truth comes out. The spies go in, and yet somehow they forget all these memories of what God has done for them, and it's gone. They, they could boldly say, God's got us covered. He'll take care of this. And they don't. They 
come out of the promised land after spying it out, and they ignore God. They, they forget God. And I don't know about you, but for me, I've seen a lot of times in life where that feels uncomfortably familiar. I look at my life and I think, I'm, I'm saved by grace. God has done the impossible for me. And yet, a trial comes up. And I could, we could, live out of gratitude and just say, you know what, God has already done the impossible. He's going to come through. Instead, trials show up and we forget. And we'd say, this is an impossible situation. And we get stressed, we panic, we try to handle things on our own. We forget about God. Well, the Israelites had that moment. We're much like that. Their story is our story. So back to the Israelites. When the spies come back out of the land, ten of them have really forgotten how God can work the impossible. It was God who sent the spies into the land, but already by the time they come out, 40 days later, they're already treating it as though God wasn't even a part of this. And so they say to Moses and the community, we went to the land that you sent us to instead of we went to the land God sent us to, and God is already out of their equation. We do that too. We forget about God so often and then try to face these impossible situations, and it's dangerous. It doesn't work out. You know, we, we lose hope because we step away from the only one that could make the situation possible. So these ten spies, they, they lose hope, and they give a speech to Moses and the community about what they've seen in the land, and their words, you can just hear the despair. They've already given up. They say, the people there are too strong. The cities are large. They're fortified. It's impossible. And actually, they tell the people, word for word, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. Numbers 14, verse 31. Really, for those 10 spies, it was the end of the story. This is impossible. God's not going to work. Let's give this up. And the whole community listens to this and follows them. They all quail. They all give up. You know, the power of these ten spies to mislead the people. And, and then we get to our scripture reading today where we see that two of the spies had belief that God could make the impossible possible. And, and they try to rally the crowd. God is with us. He's going to devour our enemies if we just trust him. We'll be able to go in. He's going to work wonders. We'll see it happen. And the people ignore it. And they want to stone a small group of guys, uh, Moses, Aaron, Joshua, Caleb, they don't believe it. And they think, this isn't going to work. And God responds to their rebellion with a merciful pardon, but he also has a punishment. And he says, okay, if you don't trust me, then you're going to have 40 more years in the wilderness. And all the ad adults alive now won't make it. They're going to die. There are consequences, as we see in Scripture, for not trusting God when life feels impossible. This story in Numbers serves as a warning um, for those who reject God's ability to provide. We see it play out with these people that there's consequences for them. But I look at this story in Numbers as a story of hope. Because I think, how awesome is it when people are able to face an impossible situation and trust God. I, I, I would assume that all of us know someone who's just been through tremendous trial and yet trusted God, and you can see the witness to God's glory that comes out of that. They say, wow, that person really, they knew that God would take care of them, that it would be okay. And in Numbers, you know, we can imagine, what if all the spies and then the whole community have faced that situation and just said, God will take care of us. You know, this feels impossible. The people are strong. Cities are fortified, but, but it's going to work. You know, if the whole community had rallied at that moment, I would assume they would have gone in and taken the land in, in due course. And eventually they do. But um, our belief in what God can do is what God's Moses. How long will these people not believe in me? It's almost like God is wondering, yeah, haven't I proven myself? Like, look what I've done so far. That belief that God longs for is a relentless hope that 
no matter the situation, no matter what comes up, no matter how tough it is, God will make it work. It's a, it's a willingness to say, I'm going to go through this and do it God's way, and he's going to work it out. In a way, it's, it's a reliance on God, no matter what comes. You know, Caleb and Joshua, these two spies that really believed, that, that caught what God was doing, because of that belief, you know, they were singled out by God. And God spoke of Caleb in Numbers 14.24, and he said, Caleb has a different spirit. He has followed me fully. You know, how amazing would that be to have that spirit, to, to be able to walk into an impossible situation and say, I'm just going to follow God fully, and he'll take care of me. He's going to work this out. And we look at that situation in Numbers of the Israelites trying to take the promised land, an impossible situation without God, but their stories are story. As I said, you know, we all face impossible situations. Let's think some, some of these through. There may be times where maybe we have to confront a loved one who we know is acting destructively. Or maybe we've seen in ourselves that we're doing something wrong and we need to, to have a conversation to, to bring that up and confess that. And those types of conversations just feel impossible to come by because we know that you say those words and things are different and there's an aftermath and it's an impossible situation. Or we may be in or see others in a relationship that is just self-destructing into a downward spiral and have no idea how to stop it or to bring peace and love back. It's an impossible situation. Maybe... Maybe our friend group is acting in a way that we don't agree with and, and we don't know how to call them out. We don't know how to stand up to that. It feels impossible. Maybe it's addiction that just has gotten the best of us and when God is saying, I want to make you new, we're coming at it saying, I, I don't know how to be made new. I don't know how to break free. It feels impossible. All of these things, even grief itself, feels impossible to get through. How do you find joy again? But here's the hope. In each of those things, God looks at it like he did the people of Israel. Hey, if you believe in me, I will, I will make it work. The words to speak will be given to us by God when difficult conversations have to be had. It's God who can reconcile in ways that you would have never thought and if reconciliation doesn't come when we want or how we want, it's God still bringing healing. It's God who brings contentment and peace, even if our friend group and our relationships are falling apart. It's, it's God who gives the power to overcome addiction. And it's God really right there in any grief providing a supernatural joy, not something we're coming up with, but a joy that, can get us through that. It's God who gives that. The amazing thing to me is that it is possible to face the impossible with a profound inner contentment and, and a confidence in God. I'll say that again. It's, it's possible to face impossible situations with a, a supernatural contentment to just say, you know what? Life feels like it's all falling apart, but it's, I'm, I'm okay. It's going to be okay somehow. I have no idea how, but somehow God's going to work this out, and it's going to be amazing in the end. I'll just wait this out and see what God does. In, in Numbers, we see a small part of the whole story of the Bible, but it's leading us to something greater. The Israelites, as we know, they eventually do move into the Promised Land. And then out of that nation, a child is born. Jesus, the King of Kings. And it's in Jesus that we fully see how God works in impossible situations. Let's think about Jesus for a minute. Jesus faced an impossible situation. You know, everything in his life, especially as we get close to celebrating Easter, we remember this. Everything was leading him to death on a cross and, and a vicious death at that. And he knew it. And and so he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's crying out one night, 
God, this feels impossible. I don't know how to get through this. I don't know how to face this. You know, can, I, can I get out of this? And yet he walks into the impossible. And death comes. And as Jesus walks into the impossible, God makes life possible. And he rises again from the dead. And not only did Jesus face this impossible situation, but he faced it for us. All of us are like the Israelites. We've all been in a place where we could trust God and just follow him and see what he does. And yet all of us have rebelled and and said, I I don't know if God will come through. I can't follow that. I'm going to do my own thing and walked in our own sinful path. And then we've taken on ourselves well, that sin. And, and the punishment for that sin is death. And so we have no way to save ourselves from that. It's an impossible situation. And it, really, it's no wonder to me that Jesus would speak about people saving themselves and salvation in Matthew 19.26. And, and Jesus said, with man, salvation is impossible. People can't save themselves. But with God, all things are possible. So Jesus faced the impossible for us. He goes to the cross. He takes this death punishment we deserve. As Pastor Rob pointed out this morning, his shed blood is for us. It cleanses us. And then Jesus rises again, conquering sin and death. I mean, think about that. His blood cleansing us. And sin and death no longer enslaving us, really the impossible has become impossible. It's amazing. Go back to Mary with her terrible week, an impossible week. She sat in her car just weeping, facing all of this, the betrayal of her friend and now the betrayal of her health. Her world really as we look at it, was crashing down on her. And yet, in the silence of that place, Mary was reminded of a Bible passage that she knew. She didn't remember the context or where it came from, just that Jesus had said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And that verse came to mind, and as Mary sat in the car, she, re- she was reminded of all the promises that she had heard over her life of what God was doing for her. And then she had flashes of a lifetime of God and all the things that he had walked her through, how he had cared for her. And she knew it. In this moment, it's an, it's an impossible week, but God's got me. I'm going to be okay. And, and so she sat in her car and, and she just prayed a short prayer. And she said, God, my life feels impossible to deal with because I'm trying to deal with it on my own. God, with you, I can face the impossible because it was always you that was going to make it possible and work it out anyway. I, I believe that our lives will be full of and have impossible feeling moments where we say, I don't know how this is going to work out. Find God in those moments and rely on him to make the impossible possible. Because how awesome would it be for God to say of all of us, as he said of Caleb, you have a different spirit. You followed me fully all the way through. Will you pray with me? Father, we... We thank you for being a God who works wonders. You are a God who has really shown all throughout the scripture, all throughout the story of the world and through all your works that you will work people out of impossible situations and make things possible. That when we want to give up, when we lose hope, we shouldn't because God, you surprise us. You You carry us through. I pray for this group of people here tonight, but also for all the people that surround us in our lives, knowing that maybe we here or people around us are going through situations that just feel 
overwhelming, feel impossible to deal with. And God, we pray for a renewing of hope and belief to come to us and the people around us that they could find you in the middle of those situations. And remember, we on our own, we're not going to get through it. It's you, God. Help us to turn to you time and again because it is you. It's always you that's going to get us through. Thank you, God, for loving us, for saving us, and for making the impossible possible. Amen.